All right. All right. We'll All right. So we are going to get things started um, as folks continue to filter in and tune in. Um, First off, thank you all for joining us on this December evening for, um, for our evening program, a, a departure from our normal Thursday evening programs, but we thought this would make for a nice Friday evening. Before I turn things over to our, um, our presenter, I'd like to just take a moment to, um, to thank our Nature Program Series sponsors. Um, and that those are Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment. So we do want to, to recognize them for their continued financial support. Um, we also want to recognize our members, lots of you who are, you know, who are watching tonight um, for their support. And if you have been enjoying Tin Mountain's programming um, and would like to support us, becoming a member is the best way to do that. And you can do that simply by going to our website and in the upper right hand corner support us there's the option to become a member um, you're also have the option there of simply donating to our nature program series um, just to help us keep our programming going um, in addition to this evening's program um, to close out 2020 we have two avian related programs and projects coming up next week on Thursday the 17th, we have our annual winter bird ecology program that Will Broussard will be presenting. Um, and that is in advance, a nice brush up um, before the Christmas bird count. Um, and this will be our 32nd annual North Conway area Christmas bird count contributing to um, the larger global effort. Um, and that's happening on Saturday the 19th. Um, in, and that includes North Conway, Bartlett, Chatham, and Jackson. And if you're interested in getting involved with that, um, you can contact Tin Mountain and we will find a place for you to count. Um, with that said, um, this evening, um, we're very excited to have um, NHPR's Annie Ropey, their environmental reporter. Um, this will be, uh, for those of you who have been to our Zoom programs before, this is going to be a little bit of a departure because Annie will be talking, uh, you know, talking to us and presenting, but it won't be um, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so more of, you know, more of a conversation. Um, however, as with our normal programming, um, you know, if you have questions, um, do please still put those into, type those into the chat feature. I'll be monitoring those. Um, and we'll ask those of Annie at the end of, um, end of the program, unless it's an immediate clarifying question. Um, the one thing that you might want to do, um, because it's not a PowerPoint presentation, in which case the, you know, the the slides won't take over the screen is individually you might in the upper right hand corner. Um, it's, you know, if you are in gallery view, if you hover your mouse up there, there's probably a little box that says speaker view. If you click on that, it's going to put the speaker myself right now, but shortly Annie in um, on the big screen. So if it is um, distracting to have all of the tiny tiles and a tiny Annie speaking, you can put her on front and center um, by doing that or, uh, or possibly pinning her. But if you go to that upper right hand corner, that should fix that feature. Otherwise, um, thank you all, you know, again, thank you for coming out. Um, and I am going to hand things over to Annie, who's going to speak about reporting on climate change here in the Granite State. Great, thank you so much, Nora. Thanks, Tim Mountain, for having me. I'm so excited to see you out here on this Friday. Uh, I've done a few of these Zoom talks now and I, I find them to be a lot more comfortable than like speaking at a podium. So I'm looking forward to taking some of your questions, but I wanted to give you just a brief overview of what our um, Climate Change Reporting Initiative by Degrees is, kind of where it came from, like what our approach has been to that. Um, and um, how you guys can get involved in helping to shape our future stories. So, um, so my title is Energy and Environment Reporter. I've been at NHPR just over three years. 
Um, and, you know, I found in those first couple of years that I was covering climate change um, a fair amount, but probably not as much as I should have been or could have been. You know, it's an easy thing to put off. It's a complicated topic. Um, and, the, you know, the daily needs of the news cycle and other sort of, you know, more uh, headline grabbing stories and, and more urgent feeling stories, even drinking water um, coverage, political coverage, um, covering energy kind of independently from climate change, those things are a little bit lower hanging and a little bit um, easier for us to gravitate toward if we're not being really intentional about making climate change a priority. So, um, you know, about a year and a half ago, my managing editor, Corey Princell and I um, began talking about how we could fix that and help me make climate change a bigger priority kind of more easily and fit it better into my job. Um, and we started to think about the reasons why climate change is difficult to cover in New Hampshire in particular. And um, to me, those it's, it's two big reasons. One is that um, the effects of climate change are not gonna be as universally kind of life and death feeling here as they are in places like say California or Florida or South Louisiana, those are the examples I always go for, but even, you know, Boston or New York City where sea level rise is a lot more um, kind of visible to more of the population. Um, climate change here, it's a little more subtle for many people and the people that it's not so subtle for, you know, are not as um, connected to all of the state's environment. Like we have very siloed sort of pockets of natural resources here, different kinds of communities, people interact with their environment in very different ways. And all of that shapes how they sort of understand or pay attention to climate change. Um, and that makes it um, tricky to just sort of lay out in a headline, you know, very simply for people to, to kind of bring them on board with it if it's a new topic for them. And the other aspect of that is that the political conversation in this state is just very different than it is in most of the rest of New England. We're a lot further behind on climate action. You know, we're a very purple state. We um, have a, a deeply entrenched sort of limited government ethos in a lot of our politics here that um, can make it hard to do some of the really broad based socialized kinds of actions that states like California, Massachusetts have done to make climate change really visible to residents, visible in the state politics. You know, in New Hampshire, the conversation is still much more, although this is beginning to change, but has for a long time been much more, should we deal with this? Is this a problem? And not so much, we acknowledge and accept that this is a problem. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to address it? And like I said, that's beginning to change and we can talk about that some more, but, um, but that's been difficult. And so we wanted to take a first step of accepting that premise for us as journalists and saying, we're not going to cover this as a both sides issue anymore. We're not going to say, do you believe in climate change, Governor Sununu? We're going to say, Governor Sununu, climate change is real. What are you going to do about it? And we've seen you know, him even just in his first two terms really shift on that issue into acknowledging it and into supporting things like offshore wind and, um, and you know, coming to the table even just a little bit um, to talk about uh, political solutions to the problem. So with all that in mind about New Hampshire, we knew we had to be really intentional and structured about how we made this a priority and how we tried to communicate with people about it. So that's why we decided to um, make this sort of a, a, a project with its own home on our website, its own name, um, a brand, a name by degrees, um, and, and a structure that could you know, really help the audience get the most out of it for a topic that can be so hard to interact with. Um, if you go to our website, nhpr.org slash climate, I feel like a, a candidate right now giving my website, but um, we, we built a dashboard that lets you click on sort of the different topics and aspects of climate change that you're interested in. This is a bit of a work in progress because of the pandemic, you know, our launch was somewhat abbreviated from what we'd initially planned. And I'll talk a little more about that later, but our hope is to eventually have a little blurb on each of those pages that explains to you, you know, why is, uh, are wire trash and landfills a climate change issue? Why um, is uh, racial justice a climate change issue? And, and gives you access to the stories about parts of this huge all encompassing issue that you care about. Um, we also really wanted to get the audience involved. Um, I put a link to our new survey in the chat. Uh, this is, it's got some new questions. So if you've taken it before, please check it out again. And if you have never taken it before, um, we've, we've got some great new questions. Our new community engagement producer, Zoe Knox, just started in the past few weeks and she's already really 
excited about working on this project and um, getting more audience input on how you're interacting with climate change in your daily life and what kind of stories you want to see us tell. So let us know what you think through that survey, please. Um, but generally, we came up with an editorial framework for this that we wanted to use to guide all of our stories. So I wanted to just explain that a little bit. Um, we, we knew this was going to be a solutions driven project. That means, again, stories that didn't say, should we do anything, but said, here are some examples of what we could do and the cost and benefit of those. Here are things they've done in other states and how those could or could not apply in New Hampshire and why. Here's what you know one business is doing and the big picture implications of that. Um, you know, I don't want to make anything seem like a silver bullet and I don't want to um, overstate New Hampshire's ability to move the needle on this problem. But, you know, climate change is something that it's a, it's a global problem with local impacts. And that means that any action locally does have a positive effect locally, even if, you know, it's 0.001% of the global um, picture that thing, you know, those things can coexist. And that is sort of the fundamental argument about whether we should or should not act is like, we're such a small state, the US is only X percent of the problem. What about China? You hear that a lot. And a lot of climate advocates in this state have really worked hard to um, try to acknowledge those things and explain why else New Hampshire could look at acting on climate change and what the sort of co-benefits of that would be beyond just fixing climate change. There's a lot of other health and economic positives in particular to consider. So we wanted to focus on that. We wanted to make human stories, individual people's stories at the center of all of the work that we did um, to make this issue feel more accessible and feel more like something that was happening to regular people. It's such an intangible issue and it feels so far away so much of the time, but it doesn't take much um, reporting to find out that this is already happening to individuals um, and, and individual people have ideas and concerns about it you know, now and in the future. So we wanted to put them front and center, kind of couch them in science and good data and facts and research and, and help people understand what those were. Um, and we wanted to look at uh, sort of these three prongs of climate change, which are the causes of it, its impacts and our strategies or responses to it. That's a sort of framework that I learned from the Vermont State Climatologist a couple of years ago. And I think it's really interesting um, and she said that, you know, the media often will focus a lot on the impacts, some on the causes and very little on the strategies. And so we wanted to focus a lot on the strategies, which, like I said, in New Hampshire is a little bit tricky because we're so, you know, there would be so much more to talk about there or so much more that's obvious to talk about there if you were in, say, Massachusetts or even Maine right now. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing to talk about in New Hampshire. So we wanted to find new ways to have that conversation. Um, and then, you know, lastly, we wanted to make sure that everything that we did was really intersectional. And by that, I mean that it was um, conscious of racial justice, that it was conscious that marginalized communities of all kinds are the most at risk from climate change, are already the most harmed by environmental ills and benefit the least from them. That's the concept of environmental justice. Um, and just because New Hampshire is a very white state, we wanted to sort of push past that and look at who is affected, whether it's a low income white family or, you know, a family of color, whether it is immigrants or, you know, anyone who already lives in the state, um, you know, climate change is going to affect them all in different ways. And we wanted to make sure that was in the focus. And I'll be the first to say that, you know, that was less of a priority for me earlier this year than I'm proud of. I, it's, it's, that's another thing that's very easy to sort of not prioritize if you're not working overtime to make it a priority when you're a white journalist in New Hampshire and it takes unlearning and it takes work and we've done a lot of that work and we have way more to do to put uh, racial and social justice at the center of our climate coverage but um, you know the events of the summer George Floyd's death everything that happened um, during the pandemic has really pushed us to to remember that to put it a lot sort of higher up in our hierarchy of, of editorial goals. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a process. And I think we've, I'm really proud of the work that we've done. And I know that we have a lot more to do. Um, so and then, you know, the COVID impacts have been interesting, like we had initially planned to launch this project on Earth Day, uh, this year, the 50th Earth Day, that obviously didn't happen. Um, 
And then we sort of didn't really know where to go from there. We ended up just kind of soft launching it in July just because we wanted to get it out there and, and work from there. And I think that's been good, but you know, COVID has been difficult to cover climate change during. I'm really proud that we've continued to make it a priority uh, and that you know, everyone at NHPR has acknowledged that it is a priority. Um, and I think people are learning a lot about climate change through COVID, like scientifically, sort of literally in the sense of, of environmental justice, you know, that communities with worse air quality are more likely to have higher rates of COVID infections and deaths. Um, that was one of those first big studies that came out early in the pandemic that brought that into the conversation. And then people are also thinking in new ways about the idea of a massive collective action problem, which is the term you hear um, social scientists use to refer to something like climate change, where it's bigger than any one person and solving it will take collective action, you know, on the part of many, many individuals to, uh, to fix. And so COVID is one of those. We've seen massive collective action to respond to it. Um, and there are a lot of lessons for climate change there. And I'll be interested to see how those continue to kind of bear out in the political conversation and the business conversation um, as the economy recovers and as people sort of think about their lives and, and how they use resources and how they spend their time in new ways, whether it's telework or, um, you know, never flying in a plane again, whatever that might be. So we have our work cut out for us trying to keep this front and center during the pandemic, but it's my full-time job and I'm, you know, really lucky to work with colleagues, a few of whom are on this, uh, this call to, um, to, to keep pushing this conversation. I'm proud to say that I, I feel we've become a leader in climate change coverage, certainly in New Hampshire and also to a certain extent in New England. That was one of our goals. Um, and it's an important conversation to have and it's not easy. So, um, so we're you know, really proud that we've, that we've brought this much higher on NHPR's list than it's been in the past. And um, we're looking forward to kind of what's to come in the new legislative session, the implications of um, Republican control of state government are really interesting for this topic. It's not just, I mean, I think a lot of climate activists and liberals assume it means we'll get nothing done on climate change. Historically, that's felt like it's been the case. A lot of climate advocates I've talked to have said, yes, we expect to be on the defensive a lot more than we'd hope to be, but there's also potentially new opportunities for compromise that we couldn't access under divided government. And, and those could be you know, potentially really important for things like solar power and energy efficiency, we will see. That's gonna be my focus going into the new year. Um, but I'm really excited about our new survey to give me some other ideas for what to cover outside of the legislature. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's thoughts. And uh, I think with that, I will take your questions. All right, Annie, thank you so much um if folks want to um you know want to either um type your question directly into the chat feature um or if you unmute yourself um you can ask your question directly of annie you maybe tell us some of the stories that you have been sharing um or yeah. new ones? <laughs> sure. Um, so, so the the stories that we did um, right around the launch were uh, pretty pandemic focused. We felt like you know we couldn't really get people to kind of turn their attention to this unless we couched it in COVID. So, um, we did uh, a piece about um, heat waves in cities like Manchester and Nashua and how much worse those would get the public health implications of those as the climate warms and how COVID this year and potentially next year is really complicated how they deal with things like warming shelters um, or cooling shelters rather um, and, and, and getting people, you know, safe places to go. Um, that was a fun one. I, you know, haven't gotten to go out, out in the field much uh, during the pandemic. So I got to go hang out at, you know, the, the park where the sprinklers were on in Manchester and talk to families who were trying to cool down. Um, we've been covering um, the sort of opportunities for job creation in clean energy for pandemic recovery. And that's introduced me to some really interesting people. There's a guy who runs an energy efficiency firm 
uh, based out of Concord, I believe, um, whose who's, um, audio I haven't done anything yet with, um, but we are hoping to soon, where he, um, he's a civil engineer. His first job was as the head engineer for the Kennedy Library in Boston. And then he went to um, Saudi Arabia to work as um, an engineer on the like company towns that would spring up on the oil fields. So he built like the schools and the camps for the workers and their families out there for many years. Um, and, and then sort of realized he didn't want to be in the oil industry for the rest of his life, felt a little brainwashed and, and came back to New Hampshire and sort of happened to quickly become appointed to one of the state's first commissions on climate change and has like dedicated the rest of his career to um to energy conservation and i i mean he's he's very like plain spoken about his story but i think it's so interesting and one thing we want to do is um a series of stories like that where people talk about like the moment or the part of their life where they really feel like they woke up to climate change or they decided to make some big change in their life like moving or deciding not to have kids um there's a woman in our survey list who I also haven't talked to yet, uh, who um, who moved to Nashua and, and decided not to get a car, you know, which is like simple enough, but you know, this is not a exactly public transit heavy state. That's an interesting climate decision here. And she does frame it as a climate decision. Um, so I'm hoping in the new year to do a series of, of just little pieces like that about people's moments in their lives that they connect with this. There's a question about that in the new survey. Um, and, uh, I mean, to, to be honest, we've been really focused on politics for the past little while. Um, but, um, I, I'm looking forward to getting back to telling individual people's stories because, you know, with the election and, and everything happening at the state legislature, that's gotten away from us a little bit. So there'll be definitely more of that to come. All right, great, thank you. Now I've got a whole, now there are a whole bunch of questions. So starting with... Um, in the first survey, what kind of things were people concerned about? What did you feel sort of what sort of came came out as as the priorities that, that people had? Yeah, the first survey was a lot more general than the one we have now. And it set a really good baseline for us on what people were interested in. So the big questions were, you know, what is this going to do to the weather? Like, what can I expect winters to look like, summers to look like? This was at like the peak of the drought that we were pushing this out. And so people wanted to know if that was going to be the new normal. And the short answer to that is like probably yes on sort of short term basis. It's going to be these like short seasonal droughts that, you know, it's this, it's uh, confusing to explain to people that we can be water rich and still at risk for drought here. Um, and that's a story I'm trying to touch on and, and what we're working on now about climate migration. Some of you might have heard our recent episode of Outside In, the podcast about this, and we're doing a sort of more New Hampshire focused, like shorter version of it. Um, that'll include some climate migrants in New Hampshire and talk about, you know, that just because we may be able to frame ourselves as a climate haven does not mean we don't have our own risks to face that that uh, population spike without proper planning, you know, could exacerbate. Um, so there was that people had a lot of political questions that, you know, very, very generally just like, why won't the state government do anything or what is the state government doing? Um, and, you know, that's definitely a tricky one to answer in a single story. So that's like an ongoing coverage area. Um, and then they were, they shared a lot of stories of just little changes they've made in their own lives, like getting, you know, heat pumps or mini splits for their lake house or um, getting rid of their car when they moved to the city or, um, putting solar panels on their house, um, and and they wanted to know people people want to know what the impact of those little changes is, and sort of acknowledging that if you know my individual impact can only is is so feel so limited, like what is the value of doing those things? And um, that's I think like a really central question for a lot of individuals who are concerned about climate change, and a, a, a theme I think I want to explore in our coverage is just because you can only do so much as an individual doesn't mean you can't do things. Um, the reusable bag story was another one like that. Like, um, I, you know, there's, there's, there's so many examples of those. And so we got some great ideas on that in the first survey and we are hoping to get more. All right, great. Um, 
So the, the next question is, how much of climate change communication is fighting misinformation um, versus fighting indifference? That's a great question. Um, that's, that is a great question. I think that it's, uh, my instinct is to say it's a lot of indifference and that some of the indifference is probably fueled by misinformation. Um, but one sort of piece of data that really changed my thinking about this um, is from the Yale Center on Climate Communication. Um, they do these great surveys about how people think about global warming, what kind of policies they support, their politics. Um, and they have been doing these surveys for at least 10 years, I think, and it have shown that over time, um, it's a bell curve of, of people who are really concerned, really not concerned, like disengaged, you know, like, like disbelieving of, of the problem. And then a bell curve of people in the middle who were like, not sure or don't really know much about it or, or, or have heard about it, but don't really know if they should be so worried yet. Um, and I've heard um, activists say before that it's those people in the middle that you really wanna target because the people at either end are very dug in. You're not gonna change their minds. And in fact, it's like, it takes more energy than it's worth to try to change minds on those extremes. So you wanna focus on, on the neutral people. Those are like your swing votes. And for climate change, the Yale surveys show that those still make up the, the bulk of the people, although the they're sort of um, farthest uh, one of their one of the ends of their spectrum, the alarmed category, uh, was the biggest, I believe, for the first time in 2018 or 19, and it's certainly been growing. And the disbelieving category is has sort of like shrunk and stabilized, you know. So you can really see that's like this just nugget of entrenched people who believe what they believe. And and as a climate reporter, my life has been a lot easier when I don't lose sleep over engaging with many of those people when I don't have to. Um, it's the people who have not thought about it much or have heard about it in passing, but not really thought about how it's going to affect them that you really want to focus on and that you want to make sure they're getting good information. So, I mean, that doesn't really answer your question. I don't really know the answer to your question, like data wise, but, um, but I mean, I think it's a combination. And I think that there are a lot of disinterested or ambivalent or disconnected people who you know have yet to be reached by good information and so that's sort of the task for people like me okay um what this is a question on um, what is the future of wind power in new hampshire so the future is probably we will have uh, large offshore wind farms maybe floating turbines probably in collaboration with Maine and Massachusetts, probably not for at least 10 years. Um, those would be far offshore. You would barely be able to see them if at all. Um, there are some fishing concerns to be dealt with there and, and a lot of infrastructure questions, but the ball is rolling on that process. It's just a really slow process. Um, and in the meantime, we could see more talk about like industry, industry springing up for that on shore. So like staging areas or, you know, people to build all the little like wiring kits and the teeny weeny parts that go inside these things like all have to be built somewhere and there's talk of doing that potentially at Pease. Um, but this is all in its really, really early stages. There's bipartisan support for it. And it's definitely a question of, of when, not if, and just sort of in what form, um, but it's gonna take a long time for that federal process to happen. As far as state waters, I've not heard any talk about that. and. Frankly, I don't even know if we have enough state waters that could support offshore wind, but I'm speaking a little out of turn there. So that's a question for me to try to report out, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, you just asked about offshore wind, but I will say there are no onshore wind projects in the works right now that I know about. I think our onshore big renewable energy focus for the next couple of years is probably more gonna be on solar. Um, but I would be interested to see if any mountaintop wind um, proposals came back up because um, theirs are so interesting to compare to offshore wind as far as like impact and the scale of the energy that you get from them. And we have a couple of them and I would be interested to see if we end up with any more before the offshore wind thing really comes to bear. Okay. Um, and this next question is, I think it's 
preface that it could either be sort of in your opinion or according to experts, but um, what would you say are the top four or five specific actions, you know, we as individuals should be taking to fight climate change? Um, so let's see. I can tell you that in New Hampshire, the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions is transportation. And after that, it's, um, I believe, home heating. And then sort of like non-combustion energy, which is like business emissions. So it's, it's things that doesn't come from actually like the burning of fuel for energy, but from other uses of, of petrochemicals. Um, those are all bigger now than, um, than electricity. Like we've made huge strides there um, in large part just because that's a regional system. It's a New England wide system and it's not, you know, subject to like political whims as much as some of these other things. So I would say um, you want to push for the electrification of transportation of your home um, heating systems um, and and just for the for the distribution of energy, like the um, more flexibility in where people can get their energy. There's a big push for more um, community power in New Hampshire right now, where towns are able to sort of um, buy and sell uh, renewable energy to uh, locals, kind of um, uh, tangentially to the utility process, which is something the utilities don't love because it it erodes their market share, but. Um, that you know, advocates say could give towns more ability to like lower their own emissions and um, and help their tax bases. Um, so those are all things that you can think about at the local level as well as like through state politics. Um, you know, if you'd asked me uh, three months ago, I would have said vote, <laughs> and I think a lot of people would have agreed. And and it, I'm not saying vote for any one in particular, but you know, climate change is certainly a huge issue in elections now more than ever. And this was really the first New Hampshire primary and first presidential cycle where it was really front and center. And that's only gonna continue. Um, so, you know, holding the Biden administration to account in whatever way you can. Um, and, and then, you know, just like energy efficiency is so, is so easy to save yourself money and just chip away at your own footprint. and. You know, that's the kind of thing where if everyone did a little bit of it, it would make a huge difference. And so the same way that you try to like save money, save water in a drought by fixing your leaky toilet, you know, upgrade your light bulbs, upgrade your fridge, go do the audit through New Hampshire Saves or the EPA to see where you could be saving money in emissions. And that helps with your own footprint. And, you know, in terms of collective action, the more people take those steps, um, the bigger like message that sends and the more commonplace it becomes and the more of an impact it has. All right, great. Um, are there, have you come across in, you know, in your reporting um, and research, any grassroots efforts or citizen science initiatives that organizations like Tin Mountain could get involved with um, in terms of measuring. I mean, I know, so up I asked the AMC has the Mountain Watch, you know, and there are a number of phenology programs, you know, looking at when things are blooming. Um, and that Liz, you know, Liz Burakowski has the snow out of UNH, does a lot of snowpack um, studies, but other, you know, other efforts that folks can get involved in, um, you know, with monitoring yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned Liz Burkowski. I love her. Um, and that's a really interesting project. Um, you can be a, um, a weather observer for the National Weather Service, which, I mean, that's not a conservation organization, but like federal weather data is so important to creating a record of, of climate change and of climate observations. I use NOAA data all the time. And so it's fun to know that people in New Hampshire are like, contributing that from their own backyards. It's really easy to become a weather spotter for the NWS. Um, they do trainings every now and then, and you know, you get to like stick the measuring stick in the snow and send them a picture of it. Um, so that comes to mind. I know um, there's a group down here on the seacoast called Nature Groupie that does a lot of citizen science projects, some of which are climate adjacent. Um, they work with groups like Blue Ocean Society on beach cleanups, that kind of thing. Um, sea Grant at UNH does a fair amount of citizen science. 
Um, I know the Nature Conservancy, um, I just know that they have at some of their preserves these little like crowdsourced projects where you take a picture of like a salt marsh from different angles and they can get a record of how that changes over time. And they're a group that's interested in citizen science. Um, and that's, I mean, that's sort of the main thing that comes up for me is citizen science when you ask that question. As far as like climate observations, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, activism groups that are not quite as, as science driven. Um, but I guess the Union of Concerned Scientists would be another one to, you know, support if not, you know, be involved in directly that kind of bridges that gap between um, research, uh, like academic observation and, and um, policy work in an interesting way. Um, and they have a great Northeast organizing director, Roger Stevenson, who's based out of Stratum, and he's um, a helpful source for me and a great guy to get in touch with on things like this. All right. Um, so, and this this next question, I think, is a little of the sort of building the airplane while you're while you're flying it, but in terms of um, you know sort of initial. Um, you know, initial data coming out about how the pandemic is impacting climate change. I know sort of early on, there were those pictures of, um, you know, some normally smog laden cities that, you know, they could see that, you know, you could see the Hollywood sign in LA, you know, when, um, in some of these cities, air quality improving um, temporarily, sort of, but we, you know, if there's thoughts on, you know, people traveling less, so potentially, you know, less of those emissions, but certainly single use plastics have, you know, and, you know, single use everything has sort of returned to the, you know, in popularity um, and sort of thoughts how those are, you know, are balancing each other. Yeah, um, I just saw the AP reported the other day that, um, I think global emissions dropped 7% this year, uh, which I thought was such an interesting statistic because, I mean, I think earlier in the pandemic, like, you know, for the second quarter or whatever, when it was sort of the sh an economic shutdown was at its height, you know, it was in the like 20s or 30s, some of those percentages. And, you know, 7% is like certainly better than nothing. It's a huge chunk when you actually sort of add up what that represents, but it's also like, all this for 7% is kind of shocking, you know, if this is, if that's what we get out of this level of disruption, like clearly this level of disruption is not the right approach. And I think that's what a lot of people have learned from the COVID experience is, you know, we, we are not asking, like people who want to solve climate change are not asking all businesses to close and for people to stop driving and to stop flying and to stop doing everything because that didn't work, you know, like, and it's not, I mean, it's been just not, um, it's not a good solution. It's not desirable. It's not marketable. It's not sustainable. Um, and it, and it didn't help that much. So I think, I mean, 7% is a huge deal, but another thing we've learned from this is like, the, the better solutions are going to be the the win-win solutions and there are trade-offs to everything that we will do and some of those trade-offs are really serious some of them affect marginalized people more than others and and some affect big 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 businesses more than others some affect you know frontline workers frontline communities but um that you know peer shutdown i don't think has proven to have the effects and certainly not the lasting effects that that some maybe hoped that it would this idea of like the earth healing kind of thing um I, I don't feel has really borne out all that much or at least you know at best it's temporary um because we're not seeing that you know the kinds of economic changes we've made are not going to be permanent nor should they be and so um and then just on the single-use plastic topic um i know that that was a big talking point earlier on uh, in the pandemic, the reusable bags issue and New Hampshire kind of lagging on whether to, to let people take those back to the store or not. Um, you know, the, the statistic that people should know is that like less than 5% of plastic bags like that are recycled and something like only 9% of all plastics ever created have been recycled. Um, it's not, there's not a good market for it. Um, and so that's a really, huge conundrum um, 
for uh, landfill heavy states like New Hampshire, for people that you know are trying to cut down on waste. Um, so, you know, if I can leave you with a tip, it would be to buy glass and metal at the grocery store instead of plastic where you can, the markets are better for those. Um, but I think to your point, Nora, like the uh, long-term implications of some of those kinds of changes are definitely not really clear yet. I will say that Portsmouth is thinking about postponing its ban on certain plastic containers that was gonna be the first municipal ban in the state. They were gonna ban all, pretty much all use of styrofoam and also some other plastic disposables on city property. Um, the styrofoam ban is citywide uh, and they're, they're thinking about putting that off by a couple of years um, so that they can focus on COVID is the argument. Um, and I think they're voting on that at their council meeting uh, on the 21st. Um, so that's an interesting one. I mean, we're starting to see now the sort of um, the the rubber band effect of people saying we can't deal with climate change right now because we have to focus on COVID economics is, is beginning to come into play more, especially in the new sort of political climate of the state. And so I think there's there's certainly more of that to come where COVID is almost becoming more of an excuse not to act um, in ways that could be damaging potentially, or, you know, just to have really important economic implications to consider. Thank you. Um, this next question comes from one of our, you know, Tin Mountain has an active energy team where we work on um, sort of renewable energy initiatives. Um, and one of our key members um, writes that 40 years ago, New Hampshire was a hotbed of alternative energy activity. Um, have you interviewed any of the activists from that era to find out what their efforts have accomplished? Yeah, one of them is the incoming House Minority Leader, Representative Ronnie Cushing. Um, he was, I think, 17 or 18 at the clamshell protests at Seabrook. Um, he's a long timer. There's a lot of people like that floating around in my world. Um, it's, I think it's really interesting how many environmentalists in New Hampshire um, cut their teeth at the clamshell protests and, and um, you know, come from that, that anti-nuclear movement. And a story I've wanted to do uh, for a long time before by degrees and have not gotten around to yet is like, I would be so interested to do sort of a story course style conversation between one of those older activists and one of these new activists, younger generation, like one of the um, people that protested at the Merrimack Station coal plant in Bow and got arrested about a year ago um, and just see what those sorts of lessons are and what kind of exchange there is there. Because that coal plant protest was described as the largest in a generation, um, basically held up against the Seabrook protests as you know the last time that there were mass arrests of any kind, and certainly they were much bigger at the Seabrook protests. Um, and I, Seabrook isn't the only thing. I mean, there's Dudley Dudley, who I've spoken to about um, she she was the uh, the face of the movement against this proposed oil refinery off Durham that I'm sure many of you know about the um, Aristotle Onassis saga, uh, and she uh, resurfaced to um, oppose this new Eversource transmission line that has now been built on the seacoast. Um, so there's plenty of those people still um, still out and working in this space, um, and. I mean, I think there's a lot of lessons in in grassroots organizing, in sort of this mutual aid kind of um, community building uh, spirit that you're seeing come up in a lot of um, the racial justice movements now. And I've seen there's a real parallel there between um, civil rights organizers of the 60s and, and what they are, um, kind of what exchange they're having with um, Black Lives Matter activists. You know, there's, there's, things to do the same and there's things to do differently. There's ways that the internet has changed to this, the way, ways that politics have changed, um, that you know, ideas around intersectionalism have changed. Um, so uh, there's, there's definitely more of those conversations I wanna have. And if anyone has a story like that to share, please get in touch. All right, great. Um, I think this, oh, no, I was gonna say our last, but they, they keep coming in. Um, so can you speak 
speak to, you know, I'm sure this is one of the things that people are, you know, particularly interested in the effects of climate change on tourism. I mean, you know, sort of thinking of maple sugaring and skiing and, you know, is this, you know, are they a motivating factor, um, you know, to take action? Yeah, let me, I'll just also address, I see the, um, the person who asked the uh, 40 years ago question has a follow up here. Um, oh, yes. Those of us who are promoting rather than protesting. That's a great question. No, sorry, I didn't, I, I took that in a completely different direction. Um, I know there was a Concord Monitor story about a guy who's had solar panels on his house in, I think, Concord since like the 60s. He might have been the first solar array in the state. That was a cool piece that Dave Brooks did probably at least a year ago. Um, but I have not had many of those conversations. I mean, this guy that I mentioned who had the experience in Saudi Arabia would be an example of folks who worked on some of the state's initial climate um, planning efforts, but that was only, you know, 20 ish years ago. So, um, so no, I mean, I don't know as much as I would like to about what alternative energy, you know, looked like as a sector in the 80s and 90s in the state. Um, and I would be very interested to learn. So definitely reach out about that as well. Um, so on the tourism question, um, lots of effects, definitely. I mean, we have such a tourism based economy that, you know, there's tourism everywhere you look and there are climate impacts everywhere you look. So, I mean, the seacoast is facing hundreds of million dollars in property value effects. There's a study going on uh, from Sea Level Rise. There's a study going on right now um, through the Rockingham Planning Commission. And um, I want to say it's the Department of Transportation where the money came from um, that will look at as uh, flooding becomes more common on Route 1A and even further inland, how will that affect um, commutes and summer traffic? And where will those um, drivers move when they can't access Route 1A due to flooding? And how will that affect density and emissions and, and um, traffic and safety in like other parts of the inner sea coast? Um, there are huge implications for the ski industry. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one, but um, one that I don't think gets talked about enough is um, the sort of trend toward consolidation in the ski industry. So you're gonna see these small ski areas uh, are gonna be less able to weather the changes um, and the warming, especially in the Southern tier, and especially those who can't afford to make their own snow or can't afford to do that enough of the season. Um, so big ski areas, you know, your loons, your Watervilles, your Cranmores, like they could be okay because they can make their own snow. And they've actually, I mean, the efficiencies in that space are really incredible. They can do so much more with so much less energy and water now than they used to be able to because they can afford to do it. And so, you know, for, for those New Englanders who like treasure their little backyard ski areas, like those are the ones that could be in danger, which is really sad. Um, and that's like a cultural effect, you know. Um, there are certainly changes in the seasons um, that could affect fall foliage, maple syrup. Um, there are uh, huge threats from climate change to some of our iconic wildlife, especially moose. Um, and, uh, and then I think that the, just the, the sort of infrastructure implications are kind of a tourism question for me because these are a lot of these small towns that have really seasonal economies, you know, are going to be facing unexpected climate effects, things like um, river flooding and, and, you know, weird precipitation events um, and weird uh, strains on their power grids that um, they'll need more revenue than ever to deal with, right? And so there's a lot of pressure on you know, the North Country in that way, or the Upper Valley um, to, to adapt um, and, and continue to support their tourism industry, even as things change, because they'll have, you know, more to spend on, on fixing up climate effects um, as, that, as that happens. I mean, and I, there are so many examples of that snowmobiling, like I could go on and on, but, um, and you also mentioned farming. Um, which we've seen in this drought that's been a huge drag on um, farmers in southeastern New Hampshire, especially. Um, it's a seasonality issue and a water issue for them. Um, 
and you know they could be incentivized to try to diversify into more agritourism to to shore up their bottom lines but you know that isn't going to work for everyone obviously so there are implications for them as well for sure Right. Annie, can I just jump in real quick? We had a fascinating, um, we had Ben Wilcox from Cranmore did one okay. of our programs last winter. And uh, I'm forgetting the woman's name, Nora from Ski. Yes, Keeler. Yeah. 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 Jessica yeah. Keeler from Ski, New Hampshire. Yeah. And it was, it was, uh, I just thought it was fascinating because they do a ton. I mean, it was the environmental changes that they have made to just, make sure that skiing is still feasible. And I guess that's kind of where I was coming at with that. Is that a motivating factor for some, for action, for some, and whether it's the ski industry or maple sugaring or tourism in general in New Hampshire, because if, you know, all that's our bread and butter and now all of a sudden, you know, we're losing our maple trees and, and so forth, that could spur some people say, whoa, this is right in our face. We've got to do something. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of where I was was thinking about that. And, you know, whether it's right or wrong, if, if it's a motivating factor and some change is happening, I think the ski industry is a perfect example of that. I was really shocked at how many changes and things, and, and not only in New Hampshire, but, you know, across the country and I'm sure even across the world, you know. Yeah. People love to ski and, and that would be, you know, yeah, we have a climate migrant that's going to be in our um, in that version of that story that's coming up, who is a mountaineering guide, an ice guide in New Hampshire, in southern New Hampshire, who is thinking about moving to Vermont so that he has more reliable snow and he considers himself to be a climate migrant. Um, but I mean, your point, Lori, also reminds me of this framing issue we deal with around how to communicate on climate change um, to like how to how to meet people where they are and help them engage with it where they are so um, this idea of like what natural resources matter to you and what sort of like outdoor uses matter to you and your livelihood and your culture um, can be a really important on-ramp for scientists journalists policymakers to um, to get people more engaged in this issue like there's you know research to suggest that that you know if you if you sort of preach on climate change in generic terms you're much less likely to get people to say that they care or feel worried about it or feel like they understand it than if you say okay you like to ski like here's what's going to happen exactly. to that. or yeah um so that's a huge goal for us is is to try to yeah just give more of those examples and 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 really center it around individuals and um and and try to figure out like who feels left out of the conversation and how to to bring them in i mean that's the job of journalism generally and something that public radio is is working harder than ever to do um and and that means that you know my this climate migration story is going to have um puerto rican migrants from hurricane maria and um that you know we want to talk about um what environmental justice means for um working class families who live near superfund sites and just you know all kinds of things that we haven't tapped into as much as i'd like on this beat um and and that process of framing is just as important in that way as it is for um for sort of the more reticent you know people if you will All right, great. Um, Annie, thank you so much for for joining us tonight and for sharing the, the fabulous work that that you're doing. Um, I we have um, folks remember in the the top of the chat, she dropped in that, um, you know, the survey, which, um, you know, we will if if you missed, um, I'll put it in. One more time at the bottom for anyone who logged on late, um, and you can also, um, you know, email me after the program. But yeah. and I just oh. dropped in my email there and our our general page. Um, please reach out anytime um, if you have story ideas or people you think I should talk to. I'm all ears, and I really appreciate all your excellent questions. It's it's really exciting that people care. Can I have one stuff. more? Can I have one more question? Sorry. Yeah. Don't Sorry. <laughs> I had one too. We didn't really, we didn't really 
didn't speak about education per se. I, I, I had a couple things, and maybe these aren't, we don't have to get into all of them, but education, both like public school education, that's, a, that's something that I am interested in how to have these conversations and teach children about these things, especially when, you know, there's just a lot of naysayers and maybe other areas of, of their life. Um, and then another one, this is completely aside, but I find it fascinating the um, connections in the natural world with say pollinators and blooming time or bird migrants. And one example is uh, horseshoe crab migration and shorebird migration and the timing of these things. See, I think things like that, that's the stuff that people can, they might notice or, or it's kind of like what you just said about the guy moving because the ice is melting and southern, you know, those kinds of things. And for me, those are the grabbers, kind of similar to I like to ski and that's why I care kind of thing. So I don't know, do you have any, can you add anything to that or expand on any of that or? Yeah, for sure. The um, the gardening season times were oh, a, yeah. a top response in our first survey. Oh, People uh, really notice yeah. the gardeners. Yeah. Um, yeah, a, a couple of the other like citizen science things that I had forgotten to mention that that reminds me of are Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, which I'm sure you all know, um, you can volunteer there. And they, you know, they have some of the first records and longest records of environmental change in the state. It's where the Clean Air Act was born. And um, I'm, I feel like all of the stories I've mentioned are ones that I have yet to finish, but I have a Hubbard Brook story about um, uh, one of their bird count uh, projects that was sort of affected by COVID, but, you know, seeing what times of year the birds come to and from Howard Brook can show you how the climate is changing in the other places that those birds go. Um, so those kind of observations are really important. And the other one is um, the volunteer lake assessment program through the Department of Environmental Services. Um, they like are actively low on volunteers. That's something I'll probably report on next summer when they're recruiting again, but um, they are, their volunteer base is is aging and shrinking and they need new people to help monitor lakes, which is another like one of the longest, cli you know, climate adjacent records of environmental change in the state. So that's a really important one too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the public education piece, like, I don't have a ton of information on that, but it's a topic we're really interested in. And I hope that you can look for some stories from our ed reporter, Sarah Gibson on that um, whenever school becomes anything other than COVID related again. Um, Cause that's, that's like, we haven't scratched the surface of that at all. And it's really interesting. Yeah. I'm gonna jump in here with a question too, if I can. Um, you mentioned transportation is the number one cause of, or contributor to climate change. Are there anything, any initiatives in the New Hampshire state government to address mass transit and put more mass transit in I think all of us who fight the traffic in the summertime on Friday afternoons, um, are there any initiatives that you know of either statewide or through the political systems that are happening to address that? Yeah, um, you know, commuter rail is definitely a, uh, a hot button in New Hampshire politics and has been for a long time. Um, the uh, Democratic gubernatorial nominee, Dan Felt, has had commuter rail on his climate agenda. Um, Governor Sununu has not historically been interested in that. I don't know if that's going to change. You know, they're widening 93, like that's been the solution instead. Um, With non proverbial <laughs> pole paint, pavement. Yeah, there. yeah. I mean, the, the short answer is no. The, the sort of more local answer is there are efforts to electrify the public transit systems in like Manchester National Concord, there's state grants for that. So some of those, um, I think, I wanna say it's, no, I can't remember if it's Manchester or Nashua, just added some propane powered school buses. Some of them are doing biodiesel buses or, um, you know, there's there will be electric buses coming um, for some of those functions. And there is state grant money that has uh, not yet been claimed to do big, um, electric vehicle charging networks, which isn't public transit, but is, you know, definitely going to be crucial to electrifying that sector. And so, you know, that's, it's sort of slow to start, but I think that's something you can expect to see in the next few years. As far as mass transit, though, I, there really isn't a lot of talk about it. And I, 
doubt there will be in the coming legislative session, but you know, that's a perennial issue. So, you know, stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, Annie, thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for, for taking this time and again for, for all of the great reporting that you're doing. And hopefully um, some of our viewers tonight will go ahead and contribute to that survey and, uh, and add their voice to it. Thank you all so much for your great questions and for having me. I appreciate it.